perfume itself, fragrance, would come through products that she used in the house. Whenever Brazil visits the bathroom, Givadar goes with them. There are around 50 million households in Brazil. All the perfumers have to do is correctly decipher their tastes. The problem is they're changing with ever-increasing speed. In the past, scent fashions evolved more slowly. The Victorians loved rich, musky fragrances. Those tastes lasted for decades before the British fell in love with lighter perfumes. Simon and Amanda Brook have recreated a Victorian perfume company. They hope the scents of the past can be their future, but can they really turn back the taste clock? You need to do this with your nose. Really breathe out hard and fast and then smell in very slowly. The Brooks are not trained perfumers and turn to scent savant Roger Dove for advice. This is Rose de May. Dove is a perfumer who champions the grand fragrances of yesteryear. He provides a sketch of the scent tastes of the 1890s. Jasmine suggests something a little bit more, you know, a button undone, a bit of décolleté on show. So the two together start to give you something which is just very feminine and luxurious. Uh, this jasmine you have, uh, you're smelling here, costs just over double the price of gold bullion. Despite their reputation for sobriety, Victorians would lose control at a whiff of civet, the smell of a wild cat's anus. Uh, this material is now banned as a natural material. Um, I have a little cache of it, which I've had for years, um, so I thought that this warranted smelling the real stuff. Um, it's quite interesting when you smell civet to think that uh, in Ethiopia, where it comes from, brides bathe in it, grooms put it in their hair as a pomade on the wedding night, and uh, in Britain, in Georgian Britain, this was the scent of the dandy, mm -hmm. because it smells totally fecal. Mm. So be prepared, it's not the prettiest thing you're ever likely to smell. Very, very sensual. I mean, this is the, the animal world. It reminds me of something, yeah. It, it's you have it's come a long way. If, if you don't think <laughs> civet's horrid, then you have come a long way. <laughs> Simon and Amanda Brooks home used to smell of air freshener and occasionally Old Spice. Now, on Monday mornings, Rose de May Tonka bean and a poppernax intermingle with bacon and egg. Simon Brook was interested in his family tree. Three generations back was John Grossmith, perfumer by royal appointment. The real treasure, which is here, and I ought to have my white gloves on for this, but here you have in John. Lipscomb Grossmith's own hand, the original formulae for almond oil brilliantine, almond shaving cream, hygienic salts. Oh, and here's a special one, Regal, which was produced for King Edward. Here we have, ah, this is a good one, Hasuno Hana, so with rose and jasmine. New mown hay, with lots of jasmine and rose and orange oak moss and civet and page after page clearly the perfume or the creativity of those sorts of things was in his genes in bringing a long dead perfumery back to life the brooks have changed their own they sold the weekend cottage and gave up their old jobs to recreate three antique scents this isn't my best attempt it'll it'll turn out looking all right I read archaeology at university, 
Uh, but when I graduated, I became an accountant. We acquired the company because it, it seemed a kind of tidy thing to do. It was about get, saying, oh, let's get this back into the family. It used to belong to the family. We found it. It's not doing anything. Let's see if we can just get it back into family ownership. A lot of the genealogy stuff is emotionally driven. And then we realised, actually, it was probably quite a good business proposition as well. One or two people said, there's a recession on. But mainly, people said, wow, what an amazing idea. The Brooks were innocents in paradise when Roger Dove took them under his wing. 2008, I gave a, a lecture at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And at the end of it, a couple came and said, we've just discovered that we are direct descendants of the Grossmith family. And I said, oh, and we started to talk about how maybe this house could be revived. But given how fast scent tastes are changing today, is it possible that perfumes created over a century ago can still have appeal? Some of the ideas they had were so removed from how the market is today. It is not what is generally fashionable in the market, but the cost of producing a scent like this is extraordinary because of the volume of natural raw materials, really of the very, very highest quality. Mm. I don't think that it will ever be mainstream, but that's part of its appeal. And this very slight retrospective feel, you know, mm. they're, they're, they're of a particular period in history, and I think people crave, certain people crave it because it suggests something legitimate and authentic. The Brooks hope to reconnect perfume connoisseurs with the scents of the past. They're not making fragrance for the fast-changing mass market. People probably like what they would call a light perfume, something that's got a lot of head notes and then rather disappears, that they refresh during the day several times. Um, ours are, are not like that. You can see the names are very exotic. This is designed to conjure up the Japanese lotus lily oh and the mysterious God. country of Japan, because in 1888 it, had, it was only just kind of opening up. Did, um, yes. Everybody yes. was very interested in the Orient. Very. Yeah. This, is, this has got a lot of bitter orange at the top. It's got quite a bit of start. It's quite dry. I think it's like dry wine or something. Yes. I think people often say, Oh, that's very different. I haven't smelt anything like that before. And I think they always, yeah, they always find them very rich. Let it settle, let it, let it dry down, and then smell it in a few minutes' time. It's such a personal thing. Does it remind you of anything? Yes, Shalimar, one of them I absolutely mm. detect. It isn't instant gratification. There's, I mean, obviously, there's a lovely start and a lovely heart note, but it carries on, there's progress. Um, and it takes time fashion, um, for, mm. for these ingredients. I like this. Good. You. Have we got the name of this? You have. That's mm. Chemel a... Nassim. Yeah. It, they are a very rich mixture. It, it, I, mean, I think it's, it's rich uh, start to finish. These perfumes transported Victorian ladies to the exotic Orient. Over at Harrods, the ladies of the modern Orient can't get enough of them. Roger Dove has to get to work early. It's just coming up to 20 to 10, and the doors of Harrods will open at 10 o'clock. In the summer, we have a very large Middle Eastern clientele. They love scent. The number one doesn't translate into um, English from Arabic because uh, most of our Middle Eastern clients will come and buy three, six, ten, twelve bottles of fragrance. Uh, we have just uh, received in these fantastic uh, presentations, which are in Baccarat crystal. The bottles are made totally by hand. And I just heard this morning that a client came yesterday who wanted to buy three pieces of each of these uh, fragrances. The Grossmith Baccarat presentations retail for around £6,000 uh, a piece. And they wanted nine of them? And they wanted nine of them. It, that's one order? And that's one order. 
the Brooks' big opportunity might be selling the Orient a vision of Victorian England. Anne Gottlieb is on her own odyssey. After weeks of refinement and adjustment, she has what she hopes is the next links. But until the teenage lads of Sao Paulo have approved it, it's still work in progress. If Gottlieb has misjudged the Brazilian scent palette, it'll be back to the drawing board. Hi, it's great to see you again. Great to see you. Yeah. How was your trip? It was long. I am so happy to be in this city. I love Brazil. Brazil is the biggest fragrance market in the world, and fragrance is selling like crazy. And it is an opportunity for brands to come here and sell their wares, and you don't get what they like unless you can talk to them and see what they keep in their bathrooms. And that's the way to really create products that they, that they love. At the last Brazilian census, there were over 27 million boys about to turn 15. What do you do if they don't like it? What will we do? Well, at this point in time, it's really just a piece of information so that we have some idea of really forecasting and doing um, all of the other logistics. At this point, it will be um, very sad if they don't like it. We are going in thinking that um, this is sort of what is called a disaster check. And I hope that that, ne that word never pops up again in the course of this product. One of the things, the aspects about this culture that fascinates me so is their attitude about sex. It's extraordinarily liberal and free, and this is true of, of guys and girls, which maybe is one of the reasons they smile so much all the time. Is it all about sex? Um, it's all about sensuality. I'm not sure it's all about sex. For guys, it's all about sex. Gottlieb has 48 hours to hear if groups of adolescents like her body spray. The boys are younger than Gottlieb had expected, so the focus group has to feel informal, a bit of a game. Behind a two-way mirror, executives hang on their every word, with millions of dollars at stake. When it comes time for the boys to grade the scent, the results are curiously similar. Ten. Eight, ten, nine, nine, nine. Six. seven, Eight. seven, nine. Look at how uncomfortable it makes them. They're all giggling. All the others yeah. seems to repeat yeah. this is the, the same, same, sure. the same yeah. word, the sure. same. Yeah. And sometimes in these, to dominate the one person's opinion, mm -hmm. and then everybody shares yeah. the yeah. same opinion. Sure. I traveled quite a distance to come here so that when a chunk of time is somewhat wasted because the group really does not give any feedback that's viable, it's frustrating, it's a waste of time. Failure is not an option. The middle market is incredibly competitive and other companies have been making their mark here for decades. Sales to Brazilian fragrance fans account for 20% of Avon's worldwide revenue. Juliana da Faria and Ana Alvarez are marketing executives. We got a lot of different words to talk about smells. It's like the Eskimos with the words in, in, uh, for ice or cold or water or whatever. So we have CC, Budum, Fudum, almost like slangs for, for describing bad odor. Chulé, <laughs> like it's just a lot of bad words. 
But then you have a lot of good words also for describing when you smell good, like fresquinha, cheirosinha, gostosinha.